Hey, welcome back. And it's finally time to talk about our next chapter, which of course is sound recordings. Remember, we're pushing everything up a week and we've got plenty of time. We'll get everything in. Um, but of course, as always, there's always current events to talk about uh, before we get to our chapter. A uh, couple of things here. Uh, number one, there's a website that I used to use for our class that always measured the weekly television ratings. Now that would either be for what is the broadcast networks, okay, and cable networks. Well, that one company went out of business a couple of years ago, and quite honestly, I could see why, because you know it's almost like ratings don't matter as much anymore. Well, another Entertainment Weekly article came out, I think it was Entertainment Weekly or something else, and it was talking about the Friday ratings for broadcast television. And it had talked about a couple of TV shows, but that Blue Bloods on CBS, the one that stars uh, Tom Selleck as the police commissioner of New York City, for those who haven't seen it, uh, it's been around for about nine or ten years. It's a long-running show, extremely successful, always seems to rule on Friday nights. Had 5.8 million viewers, and it was the number one show for the evening. Now, for some of you, that might not mean much, but let me just put it to you this way. I had talked about this at a conference a couple of years ago, how things were now starting to change. This was pre-COVID. And you could already see things starting to change with streaming services like Netflix and Hulu. And I said, you have shows now that are being renewed, that are, uh, you know, uh, advertisers are throwing big money at to advertise on these shows. And they're getting maybe six, six and a half million viewers every Thursday or Wednesday night. And I said, let's go back 18 years ago. And I went back to the year 2000, 2001, something like that. And there was a show on ABC. It was geared towards young people. And it was called My So-Called Life. It starred Claire Danes, a young actress. And it was just about life going through high school and going through the tribulations of being a 17-year-old. And, you know, it was a drama. And sometimes a drama, a, a dramedy, like a drama comedy. Well, it was, by the time it was canceled, halfway through its first season, all right, they had filmed, I think, 15 episodes, but only 10 actually aired. It was the lowest rated show on all of broadcast television. Now, at that time, they were counting, of course, ABC, NBC, CBS, Fox. They were also counting at the time... Um, before the CW, there was something else. And then there was something else besides my, uh, the My Network. So, it ranked like 130th. And yet it still, in its last show before it was canceled, it still had a million more viewers than what Blue Bloods had on Friday night. And yet here they were, you know, glamorized. Oh, Blue Bloods, number one show for the evening on Friday with 5.8 million viewers. It's a totally different landscape, a totally different television landscape, and it's going to be interesting to see. Um, I'm going to try and find this. I want to post this on the email. As the I'm going to end up posting a lot of things in your email uh, instead of trying to like hold up my uh, my tablet. Maybe the next time uh, I'll hold up my tablet more or try to use something else. But the bottom line is. Uh, the ratings is just amazing. The, 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 the article that I want to uh, post first in your email, I have to find is from about five years ago, four or five years ago. And we talked about it in class. And it was when the Netflix CEO proclaimed that network television would be dead in 15 years. I thought he was crazy. Maybe he's not so crazy. Because it's four or five years later since that article. And network TV is really not looking good right now. It really isn't. And the only thing that's really helping network television is uh, live sports. I'll give you a great example. I counted it up, people. On Saturday, starting at 12 noon and ending well after midnight, if you have the broadcast TV or basic cable network, or some advanced cable network, maybe you have an advanced cable package, okay, there were exactly 39 college football games just on Saturday alone. Never mind Thursday, never mind Friday. There were 39 college football games that were televised on Saturday. 
What's more, for those of you who are sports fans, you, you may know this, is that if, you, if it wasn't broadcast, if you couldn't get it on FS1, if you couldn't get it on the Big Ten Network or on the ACC Network or if you couldn't get it on CBS or Fox or wherever, you can go to places like ESPN, go to ESPN3, and you can stream just about any game in America live. And you can watch it over your computer. That I know because, you know, I got my master's degree at Indiana State University. And I lived out in Terre Haute for six years. That's where I did my morning radio and I did my TV for a year. And, man, one day I was in my car. I was waiting. My wife had to go into a store or something, wanted to get something. It was a Saturday. And this was actually even before my daughter. So this is like 2015. And I was looking for something, waiting for my wife, and then I decided, let me see how they're doing. I went on to the ESPN app, and I'm sitting in a parking lot in Wanakew, New Jersey, where my wife had gone into a store, and I'm watching live, in HD, on my phone, Indiana State versus Northern Iowa. Awesome. Okay. Uh, so TV ratings, who the hell knows where they're going to go from here, uh, whether it will really matter anymore. And what's more, it's the first time since the invention of television where we're going to have to now start to see, well, maybe not the first time. There have been some other attempts, and we'll talk about that in the television chapter, um, but the way TV does business. And again, the way TV does business is the Benjamin Day way, okay, is you give me money, I then put a 30 second commercial on my network of your product. So if you're General Motors or if you're Chevrolet, if you're McDonald's, if you're Budweiser, okay? You give me money, I put your 30, 30 second commercial on my network and I provide the distribution. Benjamin Day's model is still pretty much used today by radio, television, magazines, newspapers and such. Um, but it's going by the wayside. It's going by the wayside. Um, direct purchase, which is what movies, uh, direct purchase is sound recordings, um, and now of course it might be also mainly for television, as we seem to be directly purchasing, whether it's through Netflix or Hulu or Disney Plus, okay, uh, we're directly purchasing. So now let's begin our chapter, 1877. There's a Jersey boy, exit 131 off the parkway. Over in Menlo Park, this Jersey boy decides he wants to record his voice. Okay? So what he does is he gets this cylinder, just a round cylinder, and he has tin foil that he puts on it. Just like the tin foil that you would find in a, um, on, on a, uh, a soda can. Okay? He puts a needle on it, and the needle is connected to this little round cylinder. So now as he turns the other cylinder, he talks into this megaphone where the needle will pick up his vibrations. And as he's turning the cylinder, the needle is making grooves into the aluminum can. And he says, Mary had a little lamb, her fleece was white as snow. And everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. He then rolled it back, put the needle at the beginning, and this time he turned it without saying anything and the sound of his voice, well, kind of the sound of his voice. I mean, again, it was just a basic tin that had um, held on to his, the vibration of his voice. It then played back through that place where he had talked into and you, for the first time, had sound recording. Now, it's a shame that it didn't come sooner. Uh, but now sound recordings was a great find for Thomas Edison. Great Jersey boy, great Jersey boy. Um, the only problem was that he didn't develop it too much because he was actually going into much other things. For example, at the time that he decides to find out about sound recordings, he's also trying to put electric light bulbs into all the street lights in New York City while also pushing very hard to develop moving pictures or motion pictures, as we'll talk about in a later chapter. But then you start to see different things develop. And right around the turn of the century, when I mean turn of the century, into the 1900s, okay? In the early 1900s, we then developed this thing called a disc. And it was a recording. 
And what you would do is you would take this recording, this round ceramic disc, and you could see the grooves, and the grooves usually have about two or three minutes worth of material. You would then put it on to this player, which you'd have to crank up. You'd put a needle on, and there'd be a speaker coming up from where the needle was. And whatever recording was in the grooves, you would hear. And again, you would only have on these big round ceramic discs about two or three minutes tops. So it was very rare that you had anything but maybe one song of music or uh, somebody delivering a very short speech or again, like uh, Edison did with his uh, tin cylinder, maybe doing a nursery rhyme. Um, and there were very few players. Players were very expensive. And what's more is the records or what they were called, they were recordings, we shortened their name to records. Buying and keeping records was not an easy thing to do because again, you only had about two or three minutes on each side of this big ceramic disc, but they were very vulnerable. I mean, if you dropped it, it would shatter. If you hit, for example, the, 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 the corner of a chair, it would shatter. But as we got through the 20s and 30s and into the Great Depression, uh, sometimes it was a good escape. The only thing was is that come 1920, you now had radio. So if there was something that you wanted to listen to, you had the opportunity, but there was also radio. So you didn't really need to hear it, you know, in your home. Um, so when it came to the sale of sound recordings, up until World War II, there wasn't really too much going on, okay? Was there some sales? Sure. But even, for example, I was watching the PBS documentary about the history of country music recently. And even in the 20s and 30s, you know, you would have one record, which is like a two, two and a half minute song, that would be released by what was emerging as the top country, and it would sell nationwide maybe 23,000 copies. Nationwide. Okay? Uh, which is really not a huge number when you consider... How many people, even in, say, 1928, how many people were in this country? If you're only selling 23 or 26,000 records, sure, it's great at the time because nobody else is selling anything. Uh, but it really isn't a significant amount. Um, so the sound recording industry, uh, if, if, or if you were a musician, you were relying heavily on playing you know, concerts, but also getting on the radio to promote where you were playing in concerts. Um, that would all change when World War II came. And what I'm going to do is come World War II, although there was one particular person, you want to talk about another Jersey guy, okay? One particular person right up until World War II seemed to be the one person who could sell sound recordings. And that was a Jersey boy from Hoboken, New Jersey, old blue eyes, named Frank Sinatra. Frank Sinatra was able to sell sound recordings. Not a whole lot, but he was the young crooner, as they call him, that young male voice, um, and he was just selling a lot of records. And up until 1941, uh, right before the, uh, America got involved in World War II, uh, he was about it. That was about the only person who was really selling uh, at, for any you know, ma you know, major number uh, he was the one who was selling records in America. But then we go into World War II. Now, World War II, all of our, uh, our resources going, of course, into the war. But then after the war, two major things happen. Number one is the development of a new material for sound recordings. Okay? And that was vinyl. No more ceramic. Now vinyl would be for the recordings or records that you would be able to take home. Now vinyl was much more durable. I mean, you could drop it, no problem. I mean, you could tap it, it wasn't going to smash or break. You didn't want to scratch it, but at least, you know, it was much more durable. And what's more is you could put like five or six songs on one side and five or six on the other side. That's the kind of uh, maneuverability you had with vinyl to be able to put that many songs on each side. What was also major was the fact that in some cases you still might just like one song. Okay? 
So what they developed was a small recording or a small record. Now what these records were referred to as, they were called 45s. Why were they called 45s? Well, when you put them on the record player, they spun around 45 minutes or 45 rounds per minute. Whereas the big album or the new record, the vinyl record, would be 33 and a third times per minute. All right. So you had what it was now called the album. That's the big one with five or six songs on each side. And then you had the small one with still one song on each side, but it would be very affordable. So for young people, 14, 15, 16, 17 years old, if there's a new song they hear on the radio they really like, they then run ahead to the record store and they would go ahead and buy that song. And a lot of times, a small record, the one with one song on each side, would only cost 25 cents. So people would have a huge collection of, ask your grandparents or if you have great grandparents, they probably still have a 45 record collection. Oh, I got a ton of 45s. And if you say to them, hey, grandma or grandpa, uh, side A is this song. What's side B? I guarantee they know it's on side B. That was a big deal at the time. Now, something else is also happening that helps the sound recording industry and where we're really now going to see sound recordings go into leaps and bounds. Okay? Up until World War II, not a huge deal, not a big market. After World War II, we now see the development of vinyl for sound recording, but something else happens. The development of television. So now television really starts to take off in 1948. What you need now is for this brand new visual entity, this visual medium, you need talent. Well, where are you going to get talent from? Well, the only place you can go is radio. You can't go to the movies. Movie stars like the big screen. They don't want to go on this tiny little small screen. So you have to go rate radio. So now radio, which at the time had all kinds of different formats and all kinds of different entertainment going on, all live, or at least mostly live, now all their talent goes over to television. So what's radio going to do? Well, now the sound recording industry comes in and says, here's what we can do. We'll give you money. You advertise our songs. Well, it wasn't so much we give you money. I'm sorry. It's not so much that we give you money, but the sound recording industry shows up and says, well, why don't you play recorded music? And the radio station said, fine. So now what radio, which still radio is very much today, the radio business is comprised mostly. Now, again, there are still talk formats. Um, WFAN, of course, and... Uh, some other radio stations where they just do talking or something like that. But the most radio formats are still sound recordings, recorded music. All right. Um, and this is well, the, the thing I'm talking about with the money is the sense that now the sound recording industry would use radio. Because when you would hear a song on the radio, it's like an advertisement to buy it. Okay. You hear it on this, the radio, the song, you like it so much. Back then, you go to a record store, you buy the record. Now, you go to Amazon Music and you purchase the download. All right? That's what they still do with radio. Radio, when it's set up in the late 40s, is still the same setup today. Is radio and sound recording industry together? Very much so. As a matter of fact, uh, even when I was in radio, and I still hear it today, um, where... A radio DJ shows up at a concert and the bands, of course, are very, very nice to radio DJs because they need each other. They, especially the, the musical acts really need the DJ. Play my music so people hear it and then go buy it. All right. So now that you have this relationship between radio and the sound recording industry, as we begin the 1950s, the sound recording industry is going to explode. And it explodes because of one man. And we're going to talk about him on Thursday. So, we'll see you then.